has been hostess of all space now. She spoke with guest after guest. She told us about refracted light that ultraviolet light is the best and will miss more as she goes on her brilliant way. Huge puppies will help us to cope. We all hold. It was at first light You were tucked in your sinkhole so tight Arecibo, you gave us such a fright When you blew, when you blew So we watched as you Busted loose and all your cables flew And the sadness in us grew and grew About you, about you When you gazed up at the sky Searching for E.T. just by saying hi You inspired us all With your eyes Radio telescope eyes Binary pulsars were a fling Cause tracking asteroids was more your thing Till that steady phone began to ring In your head your fun and icon in astronomy second to none and we could and never love no one as much as you Hollywood's feelings for you made you a telescope most of us knew cause we saw contact and golden Yes, golden eye. But habitable exoplanets love you best. It's, it's not something that, that we say in jest. Cause you're a different scope from all the rest And part of Rico Hurricanes and earthquakes hurt you before But they won't do it anymore We'll rebuild you again To see the skies Through your eyes Well, that was just fantastic. A great way to st start tonight's All Space Considered. We are coming to you live from the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon Theater at Griffith Observatory. As you can see here, 
um, from the shot. The theater is empty. We're on the screen though. Everybody wave. That's us on the screen in the empty LNEH. So once again tonight, we are live streaming. If you want to bring us up, Matthew, you, you can do so. Switch to us. There we all are. Indeed, live streaming again. So we're all remote tonight, all space considered remote. Uh, but it is the first Friday of the month. Um, we are happy to bring you a show. Uh, it's December 4th, 2020. It feels like it is so much later, like this is the, the, the 33rd month or something this, this year, but indeed we've made it to the last one. Um, tonight, we've got a great show for you. Um, the retirement of Arecibo, perhaps, um, an asteroid grab and go, a cornucopia of habitability. I think my dog is wondering what's going on. I know he's excited about it somehow. Um, the first local FRB, Bling Bling Kilanova, Juno Perijove 30, lots of launches and do it yourself, process your own Hubble images. So that's our first half of the show. Second half of the show, we are going to do, oh, then we have a sky report, of course, as always, and then pretty pictures. And then for our second half of the show, we'll do a brief retrospective on 2020. I know we normally do that in January, but there's no show in January. It comes on the 1st, and frankly, we could not wait until February to put 2020 in the rearview mirror and move along. So we're just going to do a quick look back at it, and then finally, we are going to celebrate our very own Laura Danley. That, of course, is Dr. Laura Danley, PhD. Um, our curator here at Griffith Observatory uh, stunned us all when she announced she was going to retire. So tonight, we're going to spend... A, a good chunk of time just thanking her for everything wonderful that she's done. Um, but to start tonight's show, we are going to look at that observatory that's down in Puerto Rico. In fact, a lot of you might know, might not know we have a, a observatory there, a radio observatory and this beautiful shot of it. Oh, the light in your eyes. <laughs> oh, so, so did we get somebody to win? Uh, I'm going to win that one because let me just say, and um, hi everyone. And I know this is by everyone, but that was your, the walk-in stuff, which is all surprised me. I didn't see any of it. It's so lovely. And thank you for playing Todd yeah. Berggren. Oh, my great should. love. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and we can take, take a moment here to introduce everybody <laughs> that's with us tonight just for a second. I kind of skipped ahead on this. My dog barking at me set me so far off. He, I think he thinks he's locked in and he just needs to push the gate and it'll open. Um, so anyway, but tonight joining us, of course, is Tony Cook. Um, up in the corner there, our expert is going to bring us a rocket report. Of course, we have Patrick So down in the corner down there. And um, Dr. Lord Danley, of course, is joining us. And we're just going to move right ahead and get into it. And the reason I'm moving ahead very quickly tonight is, of course, we have a curfew here in LA. So our, our very short staff, our small number of people, Matthew, basically, is at the observatory tonight. And he's helping run, produce, switch the show from there. But he needs to get out of the park before they close the gates on him. So we are hoping that we finish the show close to 9 o'clock, right around there, which is very early for all space considered, we know. So hence my desire to move us along. Um, but here, indeed, that was the right answer, that Rundgren song. Again, a wonderful job by Hannah to pick that one as, as an, again, to honor our own Laura Danley. And it, is, it was about Arecibo, which has suffered some problems. That, that was there where it was in good repair. Here in less good repair after Hurricane Maria hit um, in 2017. And then here, uh, April 10th, a big gash when one of the cables underneath broke and, and tore it open. And then we can move ahead here and take a look and you can see some of the things Arecibo has been used for. Well, Mercury, you might think, what? It looked at a planet. Well, indeed, it actually measured the rotation of Mercury back in 1965. It was able to see ice at the bottom of craters on Mercury. So a fantastic result there. Um, here is the Crab Nebula. It saw the pulsar down in the Crab Nebula, or heard it in radio waves, and it actually discovered one of the first pulsars, or heard the very first pulsar. And this is actually what it sounds like. This is the first pulsar. Arecibo was used to do radar imaging of Venus, even, and so we saw the surface of Venus. It was able to do radar imaging of near-Earth objects, asteroids, as they flew by. We started to get pictures of them. Um, this one's a little ghostly and difficult to see what's going on, but you can start to make out the shape of it. Arecibo was used to send a signal to the globular cluster M13. In fact, Frank Drake, a radio, uh, was a professor of mine that taught me radio astronomy, sent this signal, and we're still waiting to hear anybody get back to us. Nobody has yet, um, but 
could there be aliens out there in M13 that are going to get that signal thousands of years from now? And maybe we'll hear back. I doubt it, but you never know. In fact, they tried, people tried to decode it. And the person that was most successful decoding it, believe it or not, was Carl Sagan. He got more of it right than any other single individual. He got a little of chemistry, couldn't figure it out. But give it a try yourself. Download this online and see what you can make of it. And you, this is cheating to already have it be formed as a picture. You should get it as the dots and dashes, essentially, and you have to figure out how it repeats to build that picture. Um, of course, Arecibo is famous from film. This is Contact, the famous movie with Jodie Foster. Um, and I always want to call him Owen Wilson. It's not, it's Matthew McConaughey, I know, but I, I love to get them confused. And I'm going to mock myself endlessly for confusing them now. It was in GoldenEye, I think this was, wasn't it? And James Bond film, and they did not treat Arecibo so well. I remember back in the day being upset in the theater that they blew up Arecibo. I thought that was unconscionable. Well, this leads us to what's actually happening with Arecibo here. And there's some video footage here that was taken just a, a few nights ago, a few days ago. It was in the morning, obviously. The camera monitoring it, and the cable went back and snapped. Incredibly damaged. And now this is the shocker. They were inspecting the cables with a drone the moment they snapped. You can see dust as the paint starts to come off and boom. And the drone operator suddenly says, whoa, maybe I should look at the dish. And indeed, the last cable there snaps. And, you know, the drone operator's looking what's going to happen. And tragedy, of course, has struck the, the dishes. That, that, that's not repairable. That's, you cannot simply go in there and, and put in some new cables and, and fix it up. And this is the shots from above. You can see what we're dealing with. It's, Arecibo is a mess right now. And it makes you wonder, what is the future for Arecibo? We can hope that someday it'll be back and it'll be back observing. Now, of course it can observe during the day as well as at night. And there is already a push to save the Arecibo Observatory. And you can find the, the, these folks on social media. They're folks that live on Puerto Rico, astronomers that are there. We can rebuild Arecibo. We have the technology. And should we build it maybe bigger than it was before? Better, stronger. And my dog agrees, of course, as well. So, um, but with that, we actually have other technologies out in space. And, um, you know, Patrick, why don't you tell us about um, what's been going on out there at an asteroid and well, the space probe we sent out there. And I'm going to go check on my dog, Dumbledore. So I'll be okay. right back in just a second. Sure. I'll set him loose so he stops barking at us. But tell us about what's happening out at Bennu. Well... Well, on um, October 20th, uh, history was made. Um, the NASA spacecraft OSIRIS-REx touched down on an asteroid called Bennu, uh, which we've been covering in past all spaces, and collected a sample of rock and dust from its surface. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see um, this um, the asteroid itself. Uh, the spacecraft has been surveying Bennu for, for about two years and has given us these high resolution images of Bennu. And uh, just to give you an idea of how big it is, uh, you can see its uh, size in comparison to uh, some famous uh, structures. Um, we're going to take a look at the next slide here. We will see that uh, the surveys actually have um, uh, uh, made some really detailed photographs of areas where um, the, uh, the spacecraft can collect actual uh, sample. There were actually four candidate sites, and Nightingale was uh, chosen as the uh, site to collect the, uh, the, the dust sample. We go to the next slide. Uh, in order for the spacecraft to uh, actually make this attempt to make this um, uh, collection, um, there were a few rehearsals um, in its uh, flight path to kind of gently guide the spacecraft close to the surface of the asteroid, and then, um, and then uh, 
this would be uh, would be something that they would rehearse. And then uh, before they actually did the actual uh, attempt to uh, collect the sample. Going on to the next slide, we can see this is the Osiris Rex uh, spacecraft. And as the attempt was made to collect the sample, you can see that the end, uh, there's an arm that extends to a sample collector, which is uh, shown in that red circle there. Um, in the next slide, uh, this is an animation of showing when it, uh, when the sample collector actually touches down on the surface, there's some uh, a blast of gas. And uh, we'll see it in the next animation as to why there's, there's gas being ejected from the sample collector. It touches the surface for just a few seconds and uh, pure nitrogen is blown uh, through the sample collector and, uh, and the dust is uh, actually blown through the doors and then collected um, on the perimeter of the uh, collector. All right, so this is the actual um, uh, a footage of the uh, sample collection. And uh, this is uh, five minutes and uh, there was 83 frames in this uh, picture here. Um, each frame is just about 3.6 uh, seconds each. And you can see it's basically a touch and go. Touches and then the gas is blasted out and the contact is only about five seconds on the surface. Now the, uh, the the amount of material collected was roughly should have been about sixty grams, but there was so much rock in the in the in the collection that some of it actually jammed the doors of the collection chamber, and you can see some of the uh, material leaking out, which really alarmed uh, scientists because they're thinking that they would lose uh, a lot of the uh, uh, samples from the uh, surface of Bennu. Let's take a look at the next slide here. So the arm basically um, uh, went to the, uh, uh, put the uh, sample collector into the, uh, sa into the return probe, which you see here, and it detaches the sample collector. And then in the ne next video, you can see the uh, top of the sample collector, actually, uh, <laughs> not the sample collector, but uh, we were thinking that when when we're looking at the sample collector, it looked very much like a um, air filter on a um, on an old. Uh, I think that's a Chevy, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it's that, a that was seven Chevy. Yeah, so that's that's how it did it. But um, so here we go with the uh, the lid closed on the sample return capsule. And when will this arrive on Earth? Well. Osiris Rex is coming back to Earth, but the, uh, the return capsule will land somewhere in Utah in September of 2023. Um, we also have a note here about Hayabusa 2, um, which returns on Sunday, and Tony will cover that later. Well, I'm going to tell you about some new exoplanet results. Um, it was very exciting that a paper came out doing a statistical analysis on over 4,000 exoplanets that are in our current catalog of well-known exoplanets of, of well-established. Here's the paper itself. Now I know lots of folks on it, um, all sorts of amazing astronomers, too many to go into their names tonight, all in detail, but the title of it is an interesting title, The Occurrence of Rocky Habitable Zone Planets Around Solar-Like Stars from Kepler Data. Okay, Kepler data, that's the data from the Kepler Space Telescope. That's easy to figure out. Rocky habitable zone planets, that's planets like Earth, solar-like stars, that's stars like the sun. So they're talking about how often you find Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. So that's, that's kind of amazing. Previous studies, you use the distance of the star that was based around the orbital period, and you could use the size of the planet based upon how much light it blocked out. This new study is combining that Kepler data with Gaia data, a European satellite that very accurately measured the brightness of those stars, as well as the distance to those stars. And when you have both of those, you have an absolute measurement of the luminosity of that star. It's like the wattage stamp on it, you know, how much energy it's giving off. And that's important if you want to know how much energy you're getting at that distance. You need to know how bright is that star off in the distance. And if you know the stellar flux, as it's called in this study, then you can combine it with everything and have a much better idea, is this planet habitable or not? And indeed, when you have that sort of data, you can make beautiful plots like this. We don't have time to go into all the details of it, but reliability, I love that. How reliable is this measurement at all? 
but it's installation flux. That's the energy you get from your star versus the effective temperature of the star. And of course, you can see that it almost looks like a scatter plot here, but there's details in there. They can do statistics on it and learn things. And then the next plot, and again, you don't need to understand these tonight, other than you can see this is real science where they're making measurements with error bars. And you can see this one, the installation flux versus the planet radius. Okay, so the size of the planet versus the installation flux. Again, you want it to be a small rocky planet so you can walk around on it so it has water and doesn't have too thick of an atmosphere. So they want to know what range are you really looking at here? Well, it's right or up to about two and a half times the size of Earth. You can see here, two and a half is the top and all the way down to half the size of the Earth. So those are the important things to keep in mind. Then fluxes, well, 20% of what the sun gives us up to two times the energy the sun gives us. So that's the range of things they're looking at with these stars and planets. Now we're gonna read this abstract in detail. You're gonna understand, no, of course not. All Space Considered never does these, but I wanna circle a couple of things that are important. These are the fractions that they measure, the occurrence rate, what they expect to find around stars that are like the sun. Um, for you uh, astronomers out there, they looked at G and K type stars. So um, again, stars very much like the sun, the temperature is very close, but they expect somewhere between 37% and 60% of those stars to have an Earth-like planet around it. No, yes, that's the right number. That's just, however, their conservative estimate. That's if they figure things are not all set up right, if it's being completely conservative, the habitable zone being very small. This is their more liberal estimate. This is the one they think, well, if you have a bigger range of atmospheres that could support life, there are a lot of uncertainties in here. It's between 60 and 88% could have a planet. So what does that mean for numbers? Well, it means that 300 million potentially, potentially habitable exoplanets out there around sun-like stars. So the gravity would be kind of like what it would be for us. That's just in the Milky Way as well. Remember, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies just within the universe we can observe as well. So this is what we thought these numbers would be like. And the statistics in, the, in what we're finding out there in the real galaxy is supporting this notion that there are a lot of potential ones. In fact, it means if you go to the map of where these stars are, this is basically a, a, a 100 light year diameter sphere of all the stars within a hundred light year diameter, 50 light years away from us. The sun's in the dead center of this. Of course, if I point my, at my screen with my finger, you can't see that, but if I use the mouse, I think you can. We're there. Now let me go forward and show where we expect to find that nearest habitable exoplanet, somewhere within that yellowish green sphere, within 20 light years. That's crazy, that's crazy close. And it doesn't mean there is one that close, but it means statistically, it's like, you know, if you're, if you're flipping a coin, you expect flip it twice, you should get a heads. Now you don't always, you might go 10 times in a row and not hit that heads. So this, we could be much further away, but statistics are telling us they could be this close, which is just a fantastic result. Another result out there that folks actually kind of used to think maybe could be coming from alien life out there, but intelligent alien life, turns out it's not. Um, in fact, we're kind of learning these very high energy events and most seem to come from very far away. We knew that because the signal came at a different speed and for different frequencies of light. Um, that's caused as it passes through electrons and the more electrons you pass along the way, the more that that delay happens. So if you're going from very, very far away across the universe, you'll get a very big delay. If it's close by, you won't. Well, recently one was picked up by, by some radio telescopes uh, the chime ones on the left, it couldn't really pinpoint it, but on the right, the lo more local one out of the Mojave, the STAIR-2 instrument, it's, uh, uh, anyway, it's run by a Caltech, did pick it up, and it turns out it was a magnetar that had given off this fast radio burst, this sudden burst of radio waves that we used to think came from very, very far away. In fact, most of them do one finally happened in our very own galaxy and they were able to pinpoint it for the very first time to coming from this very dense, very highly magnetized neutron star called a magnetar. Um, so very, very cool. In fact, the Swift radio telescope just saw the creation of one of these magnetars. Um, other telescopes were involved as well. And you can see here the optical image. All right, where is it? I'm, I'm seeing a bunch of smudges. Well, let me help you out here. We'll zoom in and point it out. All right, maybe you don't see it yet. We'll zoom a little more and we'll blink it. So now you can be seeing there's July 16th and May 26th, two different images. There was a brief flash of light 
and it's something called a kilonova. These two images taken very close together show the fading light, how it fades away. Um, now what happened? A couple of neutron stars were spiraling around one another and they finally merged. And no, we, Laura, we didn't do this to you. Those of you that are watched All Space Together, All Space Considered know what I'm thinking about. This is how bling is formed. And where do you get your, your bling? Well, you, you get it at K, of course. And those that want to go find what I'm talking about, go search, hunt it. If you find it before we have another All Space Considered and you tweet at us um, at our Twitter account and you, you tweet the video at us, um, we'll, we'll send you some NASA swag or something. I don't know, but um, yeah, you'll win a prize. Just well, like thank if you're... you for not embarrassing me. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> exactly. So you're very welcome. But it was one of our, our finest moments teaching people because it was a prediction that was made. And then, of course, when the gravitational wave saw it happen, we saw the flashlight where they could confirm that indeed the, the colliding neutron stars do make heavy elements like platinum and gold and all that heavy stuff. Well, this is a case where we saw this happening in another galaxy. We saw the creation of a magnetar, two neutron stars merging, forming a very dense, very massive magnetized neutron star. Probably did not form a black hole out there, though. So again, this is how they happen, spiraling neutron stars coming together, a flash of light, the kilonova that you see. Kilonova because it's not a supernova. It's not that bright but it's much brighter, about 10,000 times brighter than your average nova, your normal just stellar nova that you would see. So anyway, Tony, there have been a lot of launches that have been yeah. going on. In fact, uh, you know, we were gonna tell you all about all the launches in October, you know, since last All Space Considered, but there've really been too many. There's launches almost every two or three days now. And uh, so we thought we'd hit some of the highlights just recently. So. Uh, that was uh, on November 20th, uh, Rocket Lab, which is by um, uh, Electron, I'm sorry, uh, Rocket Lab, Electron Rocket, I should say, launched from New Zealand. Rocket Lab is a Los Angeles and New Zealand based company. And um, their goal is to launch small satellites, things like uh, CubeSats and, and other tiny satellites. But at a low price. So of course, we've learned from SpaceX that one of the ways you lower price besides making a tiny rocket, which is what uh, Rocket Lab chose to do, is to reuse things. So this particular mission was called Return to Sender because its main goal was to test a parachute system in the 40 foot tall uh, booster of the rocket and then uh, landed in the ocean off from New Zealand and then uh, see what conditions it's in to evaluate uh, what it will take to start reusing these uh, boosters. That'll save a lot of money. Um, so here's the launch on, on November 20th. Everything went perfectly. Um, you can go on. Uh, a few uh, minutes, or actually it was almost an hour because it took a long time to drift, I think, from the, with the parachute. After uh, the launch, the uh, booster did land in the ocean and was recovered in good condition. And here we see it being taken back to the factory. I don't know for sure that they're going to try using this particular booster, but again, they want to see, uh, since this experiment was very successful, just what it will take to uh, you know, perfect it so they can reuse them regularly. And uh, the payload uh, was a simple one, although it, <laughs> it, it actually has a nice story. Uh, it was 3D printed out of titanium. Uh, so it actually is a manufacturing technique used for some of the space components. But this is Noam Chomsky. And it's from a, uh, a game. And David, maybe, can you yeah. tell me again the name of the game? I, yeah, it I'm comes from Half-Life 2, Episode Half 2. 2. And evidently, if you carry this figurine the whole way, to a launch, you get something special. And I won't do any spoilers for anybody that's going to go download it tonight and play it. OK. Well, the, uh, the uh, creator of Half-Life 2 did something very nice, which is he and uh, Rocket Lab agreed that every, for every person watching this live uh, on YouTube, uh, they would donate $1. So. Uh, between him and also the everyday astronaut who decided because people were confused and were also watching his stream with the idea that they were donating, he decided to do also match whatever he got. So together they raised over $400,000 for children's their, uh, charities uh, at this launch just from people watching it. 
So <laughs> it was kind of a nice sideline. All right. Um, now, uh, after the uh, crew test flight back, you know, if you, I think it was in April, uh, now we've had the uh, NASA Crew Mission 1. So on the 15th of November, SpaceX launched its first full up NASA mission. So this one is not a test mission. It's actually carrying a crew to do work on the space station. Uh, uh, Shannon Walker, Victor Glover, Michael Hopkins, and Soichi Noguchi, who is a Japanese astronaut, uh, all of them veterans except for uh, Victor, um, who uh, was, or I, I, I don't know, I'd have to, can you back up one slide? Great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Victor Glover was a, the rookie astronaut in this one, but um, but they'll be on the space station for months, and from now on, uh, Dragon capsules will be uh, you know permanently attached to the space station. So the uh, um, spacecraft flew itself basically to the International Space Station. Only a tiny, insignificant problem with uh, air temperature and other gas temperature regulation, but that was fixed. By very simple software fixes. Uh, the secret passenger on board, which also serves as a zero gravity indicator, you can see at the very top of the screen, well, with the green arrow, that's Baby Yoda, of course. Um, pictures from the space station as Dragon approached for its automated docking. And finally, the crew was on board and, and uh, had a brief ceremony. Uh, now, from now on, the crew of the space station will be larger. The most it normally was in the past was six. Recently, it's only been three because uh, after the space shuttle missions and all, it was hard to keep a large crew on board. But now with uh, Dragon, with its ability to carry four people at a time, and plus the Soyuz being there, now you can safely, if you had to, evacuate seven people from the space station. So uh, the crew is permanently larger. Here's a picture by uh, uh, Soichi of the uh, Earthlit side of the International Space Station. You see on the bottom left corner, the Dragon capsule and the moon, of course, beautifully dangling beneath it. Um, a few days later, November 21st, uh, is a launch from Vandenberg of a Falcon 9 rocket by SpaceX. And this is launching the Michael uh, Freilich, which is a, a ocean level monitoring satellite from NASA and a number of European partners. Um, uh, so what we see is the launch here. And then just a few minutes later, the landing of the first stage on a, a landing pad, just, you know, just a short distance from the launch pad. So that's our California uh, return of a Falcon 9. Um, this one uh, here is a launch by um, China, who's, I had a question for you, Tony, do you see this as a developing space race, perhaps, seeing that China has been posturing and, you know, some of the political aspects of things that are going on, do you see us getting into a, a space race with them again? Well, I don't know if I'd call it a race so much as, um, you know, China has for a long time said that they want to develop the moon as a you know resource area to to further further exploration of the solar system so uh, so whether or not it's a race they're proceeding according to a plan that they've you know firmly established for a long time um, the US also kind of instigated some of this back with the constellation program but that was canceled um, now though everybody's really interested in getting back to the moon. So whether or not it's a race, there certainly is a lot of inter international uh, interest in, in focusing on the moon. It's not a race, and China said it's not a race because the US you know, settled that back in 1969. Yeah. Um, so, but, but, this, but this is a launch to the moon that they've done. That's right. So, so um, but you know, as I said, as part of a program, this is, this is the, uh, fifth probe, and actually the third operating probe on the moon right now from China. So, you know, as I said, they're sticking to their plan. Um, this is uh, the landing site uh, uh, that kind of curved area is Mari or a sinus iridum, which uh, we also saw with the Chinese three landing, so two fairly close to each other. 
Uh, the, the area it landed in is called Oceanus Procellarum, uh, one of the seas of the moon, you know, kind of a lava basin. And uh, the idea was to, right after the landing, uh, take pictures, get a sample, and launch that sample right back to Earth within hours of the landing. And all of this went flawlessly. Um, apparently, there was some slight glitch in the in the landing, and even though they were scheduled to show it live on TV, suddenly the, the coverage cut out and there was no word as to what happened for about an hour. It was something like the early landings of Falcon 9s on uh, you know, the drone ships. We really didn't know what happened for a while. But um, anyway, uh, so it seems to have worked well. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Mons Rimker off in the distance. And uh, the next picture shows a sample being collected from the surface. And again, this was only like two or three hours after the landing. So this all happened pretty quick. Then they put that in a hopper, very much like what Patrick showed us with the uh, OSIRIS-REx. And it launched from the uh, landing pod, which is still working on the moon. And uh, it'll rendezvous with another spacecraft and then make it back to Earth. So. Yeah. Um, so it's on its way also as a sample from the moon, the first collected by China. Actually, the first collected since 1976 when the Soviets did their last robotic collection of rocks on the moon. Mm. Now, is it going to beat the Hayabusa return, which is going to get here That's first? right. Actually, uh, half an hour from now, the uh, capsule returned on Hayabusa 2, which was operating around asteroid Ryugu at the same time that uh, OSIRIS-REx was collecting stuff from, from uh, uh, Bennu. Uh, it actually will separate from the, the, I'm sorry, the capsule that collected stuff from Ryugu, collected by the Japanese uh, probe Hayabusa 2, will uh, separate in about 30 minutes. And that probe will then head towards Australia, where in a, in a couple of days, uh, it will, I'm sorry, it's actually tomorrow, about 24 hours from now, the uh, sample should land in Australia. Uh, there's live coverage available on YouTube. Uh, JAXA, AAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, has a number of channels that will be covering the key steps of this, and they do have English language. So if you just Google JAXA, YouTube, you'll see the different programs and whatever language you want to watch it in, it's there. Um, and then another important thing coming up this weekend, same day, and in fact, at the same time that Ryugu is landing, I mean, the sample of Ryugu is landing in Australia, uh, within a few minutes of that is also the scheduled launch of a new SpaceX spacecraft. This is the uh, Dragon 2. It's very much like what the astronauts rode to the space station in, except that it doesn't have the escape rocket system in it. And this is just for carrying cargo. So it can carry cargo and uh, and stay docked to the space station until they fill it back up again with experiments they run to return to Earth, and then it will land in the ocean just like the crew version does. Uh, this is a lot bigger, though, than their earlier uh, cargo carrying SpaceX thing. So this will happen Saturday. So, then so I hope somebody Saturday. contacted space traffic control to make sure that they don't collide well, space is big, I know, but we're getting to that point. All these launches, there well, is coordination between governments. Starlink satellites or something. Right? Yeah, you got to dodge the Starlink. Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking right, of SpaceX. So, but, but what space nerds are actually worried about this weekend isn't any of those normal flights. It's uh, something that could happen as early as Sunday. Um, this is the SN8 uh, Starship prototype spacecraft in Boca Chica, Texas. Now this has been delayed a number of times, but the tests have been getting better and better with it. So we're expecting as early as 9 a.m. on Sunday, um, this could take off. It'll go up 12 and a half kilometers, produce a really scary maneuver where it has to kind of belly flop and then swing on itself and then land on its tail as we've seen like with the Falcon 9. But this thing is as big as the fuel tank on a, on a space shuttle. And it's the upper stage of a thing that will dwarf the Saturn V when it's in full operation. And Elon Musk today reiterated that these could start landing on Mars with cargo by 2024, followed by people in 2026. And he's sticking by that. 
So that's why a lot of people are really interested in this. This is a very big game changer if it works. So anyway, stay tuned yeah. as it says. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it's, it's certainly uh, something to watch. Um, so now, now finally, Patrick, we're here for another perijove or another PJ report coming from Jupiter. So yes. what's happening out there at Jupiter? Okay, well, I don't have my PJs on, but I'll, I'll tell you about the perijove. One um, of these days, in fact, audience, <laughs> tweet at us the PJs that you think Patrick should wear at our next All Space Considered. Um, tweet the picture, then we'll, um, we'll, I don't know, we probably can't convince them. It'll end up being me that has to wear them. I know how this works. Oh, anyway, oh, oh maybe someone on our team could be creative. Or maybe, maybe Tony, seeing that he's the next, anyway. <laughs> anyway, on, on to, um, so PJ, uh, so PJ is in short stands for Perijove, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, NASA spacecraft uh, Juno has made its uh, furtive, <clears throat> excuse me one moment, has made its furtive uh, close pass at the, um, the our gas giant uh, planet Jupiter. And uh, we're going to show you just some of the amazing pictures that it's uh, shot when it uh, flew over the North Pole of Jupiter, uh, starting with this one. Here we're looking down at close to the polar region of Jupiter, which uh, shows you as it, it's kind of color enhanced picture, which is uh, shows you the clouds are kind of bluish in this area. And as uh, Juno went um, further around uh, uh, Jupiter, we begin to see some of these uh, uh, really ripply structures uh, known as um, folded film, filamentary um, uh, regions. Uh, we can take a closer look at the next image, which is just shows you how intricate these uh, these um, clouds are, and they're, they're kind of like almost like cloud ribbons, uh, as we see here. Um, in the next image, uh, this is a very interesting one. Uh, the images that we see are really color enhanced, but uh, uh, one of the, um, this particular image is made in true color. So if you were to look at uh, Jupiter with your eyes from the vantage point of Juno, you would just see that basically Jupiter is kind of, uh, kind of like a, mo uh, a peach type uh, color. So what happens if you enhance, color enhance this picture? Well, let's go to the next image. You begin to see some really interesting detail. There's a, there are two storms and a counter rotating in um, in opposite directions and drawing some uh, clouds in, in between. So here's an even super enhanced, color enhanced uh, image just to show you um, the kind of uh, circulation that's go going on. Uh, our next image is uh, it's kind of interesting. If you imagine looking at the Grand Canyon, um, uh, this is what you see, you see, well, not actually, you know, you, imagine um, a cloud canyon on Jupiter. So um, there is a way to actually look at this in 3D. I, I try, uh, if you close one of your eyes and look at this image, you can see that the walls of the canyon, which is that kind of orange uh, boundary there, um, are, the, are the cliffs and then uh, the entire canyon is down below. And I've kind of done this and it, it, look, it, it really does bring out some of the three dimensionality of uh, Jupiter. So uh, these are just a snippet of, of, of the few of the images that uh, Juno is, um, has taken. And people actually have uh, gone in and um, color enhanced these images to bring out some of the detail so that scientists can learn some of the features of, uh, of Jupiter's atmosphere. In fact, we have our very own web page here showing you how you can do it. And Laura, you kind of led this effort through some of our um, efforts in training of our staff and worked out a way to show other folks how to do this. And you're gonna tell us all about that effort um, but with yeah. a little bit of a twist. So take it away. You bet. So um, Patrick just showed you some images and showed what a difference it can make when you enhance them. And if you are, have been seeing our shows before, or familiar with the Juno mission, you know that um, the camera there was really kind of, um, uh, there, aren't, there, there isn't a lot of science data that came from that, but a lot of the images that came out uh, were not processed so much by scientists, but by the public. They're available to everybody, so anyone who is 
interested and knows how to use some image processing software can make their own Juno images. And that is indeed what we did uh, last August. We told you all about it with the little video on the web to teach you how to do it. And so um, now today we are introducing a second installment of our image processing. In the next slide, you'll see a new web page up do it yourself, process your own Hubble images. So this is a little bit different because the Hubble images uh, were taken primarily for science reasons through filters and so forth that uh, were important to scientists. But nonetheless, there is an enormous archive of all of these images. And with just a few tips and tricks, uh, you too can download Hubble data, bring it into an image processing software environment and make your own beautiful Hubble images. So we have created a video, video it's on this page, uh, to teach you exactly how to do that. And you can do it, the two key takeaways, you can do it for free, everything on here is free. And second of all, you can do it with no experience whatsoever because we start at the very beginning and teach you how to even do the first thing like import a file and download software. So um, I know we're all gonna be indoors a lot the next couple of weeks and with the holidays coming, um, it might be a fun opportunity to learn something new, exercise your artistic talents. Uh, you can even make pictures to give to loved ones and family members. So uh, we encourage you to take a look and learn how to do Hubble images. Um, now, of course, Hubble uh, has sort of two parts of its life. Here's that beautiful telescope. I think some of you know, I was at the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute for 10 years. And uh, through launch, through the dreaded spherical aberration, through the repair, and um, I left there in 1997. Uh, but the, uh, uh, there are sort of two different phases. There was the first part, um, and if we go to the next slide, Hubble took a lot of uh, data and images, but as you can see, they were kind of blurry. They had the spherical aberration problem, but we still got an amazing amount of science out of it. Uh, this is of the Orion Nebula and those little dots there are stars actually in formation. And I don't have the cursor, but that kind of big blob to the right side. Uh, yeah, that one uh, is kind of well known later. You've seen many pictures of it in the Orion Nebula. It's a region where stars are collapsing in, in very dense disks of dust. Ooh, dense disks of dust uh, and creating new stars and planets. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we go on to see more of some of their discoveries, uh, stars that are dying. On the left, another amazing discovery, when the supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud, supernova 1987A, blew up, we were actually able to watch the shell of gas come off, and no one had seen anything like this um, until Hubble. On the right, this is a picture of a star called Eta Carina, the, or Carina, uh, potato, potato, uh, that ha is blowing off its outer shells in the last kind of throes of its life. But you can see again, the problems created by the imaging system. A few more, next slide. Uh, we did learn tremendous amount about uh, the cores of galaxies, found that black holes live in many of them. Most of them confirmed the existence of the first, uh, con you know, uh, detected, observationally confirmed black hole, saw jets in the center of galaxies. And I love the one on the lower right, that X marks the spot in uh, M57 location of a dust disk where uh, another black hole resides. So huge um, improvement there. But again, look at the quality of the images compared to what we've seen now. Keep going. Next slide. Uh, of course, Hubble was designed to do galaxies and study stars and galaxies and understand the expansion of the universe from doing that. But again, uh, this galaxy on the left, M100, you can see the problems. Um, but nonetheless, on the right, we see a gravitational lens, which was also sort of a, a new cottage industry, just coming, people were just understanding these things that uh, we now understand are uh, a, fa a factor or a figment of space-time curvature. Um, but Hubble made those discoveries too. So it was doing great science. It just wasn't, um, oh, can we go back? Yeah. Going crazy on you there, sorry. That's all right. Um, uh, it just wasn't uh, going to, um, so it was doing great science, but the images, I don't wanna say stunk, but <laughs> they weren't what they could be. So 1993, yay, servicing mission. And there've been several servicing missions since. And, um, and so we uh, have much improved optics and I'm gonna run through a couple pretty pictures. And with this, I'm gonna emphasize 
um, you know, just how they look. Now, of course, this is the before and after of the same galaxy. So you can see there's just a tremendous amount of more detail. In the next slide, um, again, there's that uh, Eta Carina um, that, and compare it in the next slide to the uh, pre-servicing mission image, you can really see uh, what a difference that made. But look at that image on the right. I mean, how absolutely insane is that <laughs> to be able to look at, I mean, it just, I actually studied as a grad student and part of my uh, PhD work was uh, studying that object. And, you know, I mean, that was like an artist drawing. You, just, you didn't see things like that. It was in incredible. Um, next slide shows, uh, again, um, one of my favorite planetary nebulae. You can really go to town on all these beautiful images, the cat's eye nebula, a star puffing off its outer layers. And the next one, uh, another planetary nebula, just because it's cool and beautiful. Next one, uh, more planetary nebulae. So the whole point is they're beautiful. And that's what we're emphasizing here is, is you too can create these beautiful images out of the raw data. Um, that picture on the right, uh, you might recognize as the bu bubble nebula. And if you watch any of our videos on YouTube, you know that's our closing screen because uh, we love that nebula. Um, next slide shows the ever famous and lovely uh, pillars of creation. And uh, that one was taken in 1995, but it was taken again in 20, oh, I hope I have these dates right. 2014 is the next one, I believe. And uh, with much improved cameras, as I say, every servicing mission helped improve our ability to see and um, you know detect fine detail in these things, and even took us into the infrared, infrared, where you see again that pillars now in infrared instead of visible. All these data are available to you on uh, their website to play with. Next slide um, is oh, is a detail. I just love this one because it looks like a little fairy. <laughs> <laughs> with the little wings and the nice wand, you know, casting a spell of loveliness. Um, and so again, just looking at the aesthetics of these. Next one, uh, I love this one, uh, Trumpler 14, I think it is. Uh, it's a star cluster and it just, you know, crystal, beautiful uh, stars uh, in being born out of that nebula. And then finally, uh, back to galaxies. This is a, a beautiful image of the Sombrero galaxy. Again, all of these data are available. Next one, I think is the last one. Oh no, I think that's the second to last one. I mean, just a beautiful image of two galaxies colliding. And the last one here is a cluster of galaxies, but you can see those arcs, uh, which uh, we now know are gravitational lenses that are of galaxies. And I have to say it, far, far away, uh, way beyond these foreground galaxies being amplified, brightened, and stretched out so we can actually see galaxies ridiculously far away. Um, so uh, just what Hubble has done, I had to take a moment to um, speak to the extraordinary legacy of the Hubble telescope. So with that, in the next slide, we'll come back to teaching you how to do it yourself. Um, so it'll be on the website. If you go to our homepage, you'll find a button to click that will take you to this page. And there's the video and there's a PDF with a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step detailed explanation of what to do. Uh, in the next slide, oh yes. Uh, just to say that this came um, from a class that Patrick and I taught uh, last summer uh, and on Hubble image processing. And it's just a happy memory for me. So Patrick, I wanted to just acknowledge that. Uh, this Griffith U was a training program that um, I instituted, gosh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And from time to time, we were able to do some trainings. Um, and so this was part of that program. And uh, we captured on video. And now we've just posted it for your enjoyment and learning uh, benefits. Next slide. Um, we teach you how to get to the Hubble Legacy Archive, download images, and then the next slide shows the image processing software GIMP that is free. If you already know something like Photoshop or whatever, that's great. But if you don't, if you have no idea how to do it, you can just download this free image processing software. And again, we teach you, you know, once you get in it and you learn the 12 things you have to do or eight things you have to do, then you just start playing with buttons and switches and, and look at how your images change. And it doesn't matter. There's, there's no mistakes to be made. You just, it, the whole point is to have but, some fun. And then you discover it's 4 a.m. <laughs> oh, all night long.
<laughs> That's exactly right. Um, so uh, it, in the next slide, uh, I think we have just oh, a little outline of what's on there. Again, what's the telescope? Why did we choose? The, why did astronomers choose these filters? Um, and what kinds of images can you make, how to do it. And then we walk you through your own pillars of creation. Um, and once you've done that one, then hopefully you'll just go nuts. And uh, well, I don't mean you'll hopefully you'll go nuts. <laughs> that was a bad, you know, have a lot of fun and play, play, play. So with that, um, I'd like to, uh, don't switch yet. I'm just gonna say that in that class I mentioned, we asked our, our students, many of whom are some of the guides that I see in our chat. Hello guides. Um, and so we will be um, sharing with you uh, some of the images that they showed. So David, can you, oh, <laughs> David, can you hit the next one? So uh, that speaks to the incredible artistry and um, talent and just willingness to dive in and do it. Many of those uh, folks in that class had never done it before. And you just dive in and lo and behold, look at what you can do. So um, I do encourage you, the kind of easier beginner one is to look at the Juno one that we mentioned at the start of this presentation, then go to the Hubble, it's kind of uh, the next step of of difficulty, but uh, but we hope you'll enjoy it and um, get a lot out of it and share it with us when you get the get something uh, that you want us to see. So with that, I think Patrick, I pass to you because I think yeah. you're telling us what's in the night sky tonight. What's in the night sky? Well, thank you, yeah. Laura, for that presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing again, folks. Tweet at us all the Hubble images you process after you watch those videos on our website. Go ahead and tweet. Hey, can I say? Can I just? Some shameless self-promotion, tweet at me too, because I'm well, in the city. Tweet my personal one, which is at Laura Danley. So you'll find it. But Laura underscore Danley, I think. At Laura underscore Danley, yeah. Yeah, so um, we're expecting to see at Laura underscore Danley tweet lots of Hubble pictures at us uh -huh. at All Space Considered. Considered. So Patrick, take it away on the Sky Report. Okay, so um, and of course you can get creative and and make some really beautiful greeting cards and things like that out of those Hubble images. All right, so uh, we're looking at a the night sky here in the evening, and uh, one of the things that you can see is the bright orange planet Mars, and uh, it's in the southwest. It's a picture that Tony took uh, last month. Uh, the dark feature at the top, the indicated by the arrow in our next image is a Certus Manger. I think we're stuck, there we go. And uh, all right, so that's Mars for you. Um, the, uh, in the next image, there are two planets uh, that you can see in the evening at the low in the Southwest. Uh, the Saturn and Jupiter, of course, we know Sat uh, Jupiter with its uh, Juno spacecraft going around it. Uh, these planets are fairly close together. In fact, the last month I took this picture uh, showing Saturn and Jupiter, and below that is the overblown and overexposed uh, crescent moon. But look how far they are apart uh, last month. Well, the moon's going to be in our next image um, as it goes around the Earth, uh, be positioned um, on the 16th, uh, right below Ju Saturn and Jupiter. But look, Jupiter and Saturn are so close, they've almost merged. So we're going to have to zoom into this uh, view and see what this looks like on the night of the 16th. You want to go out and see this. This is uh, really um, a kind of like a picturesque view. And uh, make sure you bring your camera and take a picture of the moon and uh, Saturn and Jupiter. I've circled it there because look how close they've got. Um, in comparison to the moon, they're almost uh, about a moon diameter um, apart. But that's not all they're going to actually get a lot closer. And the reason why we see them so close is not that they're actually going to collide 
in, um, in the sky. It's because of our line of sight. The red line goes through Jupiter as we look at it. That's our line of sight. And then there's a blue line there. In the next few days, things are going to get very interesting. Jupiter will move in its orbit. And the uh, distance between, those, the, between the red and blue lines will get even closer. How close will these planets get? Well, let's take a look at our next image. Uh, on the 17th, they will be about 80% of the diameter of the moon. And we're going to go through the next sequence there. Here's the next day, um, the 18th, 19th, uh, the 20th. And the closest they will get is the 21st. And we're going to call this the Great Conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, normally, they're, they're about a de degree apart. And that happens every 30 years. But this is very close and it's historically so close. If we go to the next image, you can see how close they are. Um, that line indicates the diameter of the moon. They will be about one fifth of the diameter of the moon apart. And um, this has not happened. In fact, the last time this happened uh, was in uh, 1623. So nearly 400 years ago. The next time you see this, because this is a once in a lifetime view, uh, will be um, March 15th in the year 2080. Through a telescope, it is possible to see uh, two, the two planets and the moons together in the same field of view. And I think, um, uh, Tony, you're planning to, to take a photograph of this? Yep, got my telescope all set up. And because it's low on the horizon, I had to find a place where I know I can see it for sure. Yeah. Okay. And we currently are working out some plans to bring this image to you live from Griffith Observatory as well on the 21st. But stay tuned for that announcement. Um, we're working out all the details of how that's all going to work. So watch our web page and watch our social media. Can I also add, I know there's a lot of attention on the 21st and you totally want to watch on the 21st. But to me, one of the really cool things is just watching them every night, boom, 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 get closer. So um, as I've done before with all well, it's too late now, I think they're set, but uh, you know, go out tomorrow, take a look, go out the next night, take another look because they're moving very quickly. It's we who are moving the most actually, uh, but that their alignment is changing quickly and, um, and it's fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Now, something else is happening on the 21st as well. Although I agree with Laura, watch them night to night tonight, watch until you see, then the closest on the 21st, and then watch them get further apart. It's all part of the action, all part of the dance of those planets. But the 21st is a special night. Patrick, what, or a special day, what's going on that day? Yeah, um, I mean, on, uh, just hours before the, the Great Conjunction, uh, we have the uh, winter solstice uh, that occurs at 2.02 a.m. And uh, this is the point where, where the sun in its path around the sky, you can see that kind of pink line there, reaches its southernmost point. Um, it also marks the first day of, uh, of winter in the Northern Hemisphere and the first day of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, in our next image, after that, uh, let's not forget the morning sky. Uh, get up in the early morning of the 12th and you'll see a beautiful, beautiful crescent moon positioned above the brilliant planet uh, Venus. And um, uh, this month is the Geminid meteor shower month, which occurs on the the peak is the 30th, uh, the first night of the 13th to the morning of the 14th. Best time to see it is uh, look on the morning of the 14th at uh, 1 a.m. and you'll see in a clear dark sky between 50 to up to over 100 meteors per hour. This is a particularly strong uh, shower. Don't forget to, uh, to look at the moon phases and uh, here they are. Here's our moon calendar uh, with our uh, snow glow themed uh, uh, moon phases. Okay, so that's all for the sky report. Well, thank you so much for that, Patrick. We've got a few pretty pictures to show folks. Um, take a little bit of a break. We'll gaze upon them here. If you need to run and use the restroom or grab a, a snack from the kitchen, now's your chance. But it's only going to be a few minutes long here, and we're going to get right back to it. Again, um, we have an out time tonight that's earlier than normal. So let's move on to our pretty pictures. Here, this is the beautiful Andromeda Galaxy, and this is by our own Griffith Observatory, Anthony Perkic. Um, a beautiful image of Andromeda. This was my thesis galaxy, so uh, I particularly really appreciate this. Amazing. This is the Owl Cluster. 
another Anthony Perkic image telescope demonstrator for us. And once again, Anthony with C60 or NGC 7331 for those of you into the new galactic catalog. It's a spiral galaxy, a gorgeous image of it. Here we have a flocculent spiral. This is the sculptor galaxy and also taken by Anthony. All of these are taken by him. One of those planetary nebulae. This is C63 or the Helix Nebula. And I have to say, this is an amazing, amazing image of this planetary nebula by Anthony. Another star cluster, M47. And the Flaming Star Nebula, IC405, for those of you keeping score. And of course, the Horsehead Nebula, the famous Horsehead by Anthony. And this is M78. This is Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. Indeed, it does look rather ghostly. Another one by Mr. Perkic. I know I'm butchering your name. One day you'll you'll correct me on this, Anthony. Correct. Now this one is, <laughs> is that correct? I'm getting it right? Yes, okay, I, good. I, I hope I am. Asked him the other day. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you. Yeah. Now, yeah. now this one was not taken by Anthony, but this was taken by Patrick. Yep, that's the conjunction uh, we mentioned in the Sky Report. So Patrick, have you been going out nightly getting images? Is I, I hope to do so, so we can make a little movie of it. Yeah, indeed. That, it'll be a lot of fun to see. And this is a this is this was the night after that other picture was taken. And our own Katie Flynn took this beautiful picture of the observatory down below with the city of Los Angeles and the sunset colors along with the moon. Just a beautiful picture, New York City. Yeah, I can't read the name, but this fellow lives in New Jersey, right across from New York, and sends us sky pictures for us to use. Well, they're just fantastic. Anthony Alexander something. Krivinskishev. Okay, now that name I did butcher, so my apologies. I need to practice that. But we appreciate it. He sends lots of pictures to us. Oh, they're gorgeous, and we're very happy to be able to use them. All of these are from, from him. This one's by our own David Pinsky, museum guy David Pinsky, very talented astrophotographer, photographer. Just a gorgeous picture. And this next one was found, um, I saw it on, on Twitter by, by Gerardo um, Ferrarino. And this, of course, is Andromeda, along with the, its companions, with some folks out on a, a distant hill. And the zoom makes it look big. What a beautiful picture. And then a, an image taken from a Hubble survey by my friend, Dr. Julianne Del Canton. Um, maybe we can get her on the show someday to talk about her new Hubble survey of these disturbed merging galaxies. She's gotten some really crazy beautiful pictures of galaxies and they're just fun to look at. And we've got some sun pictures. The sun's coming back to life. We're coming out of solar minimum and starting to see some sunspots. And this again was Alexander that sent them to us and then David Pinsky got some photos for us. And here's that sunspot. Always fun to start showing off the sunspot cycle. Beautiful moon with some migrating geese in front. And then a, a full moon by David Pinsky. And of course, the halo around the moon the other night that was just gorgeous, caused by ice crystals up in the sky. Picture of Los Angeles with the rising moon off in the background. Beautiful evening shot. Now, finally, we're ready to move on to our second half here. Um, we're not going to take much more of a break than that. We don't have any music for you or anything like that. But we do want to look back at 2020. And let me see how we're doing on time here. I think we're actually doing quite well, which is terrific. We're almost exactly on schedule, maybe four minutes behind, but we can deal with that, folks. Um, so 2020 was an interesting um, year. And uh, Laura had a talk, the decade ahead, will we still reach for the stars, January 27th, 2020. 
And she had some really inspirational quotes in there about what lessons can be found in the achievements of the past as we look to the challenges ahead for the future of humanity. I doubt she knew what was in front of us in 2020 when she, when she was thinking this and creating this talk. Um, you know, in dealing with today's challenges, we can find the lessons in the past. In 2019, we celebrated 50 years since we put men on the moon. Will we and can we undertake such future endeavors? Join Observatory Curator Dr. Dr. Laura Danley Monday, January 27th, to find out. So this is really aspirational. It's, you know, sort of the, the side of looking forward with hope, with and I remember talking to you, Laura, about this, about the future and about how you really started to think maybe we can make some change and we can use this and leverage technology in the next decade. We can start to see things change. You know, we have to solve climate change, but there's there's some hope going on. Well, then, of course, we have uh, in All Space Considered land, we had a wonderful conversation with All Spitzer Considered that feels like it was a decade ago that Spitzer Telescope ended its its mission, but it was only in January of this year. Um, we had Nick Scoville and Andreas Feist, now that name I'm butchering too, um, come talk to us about the wonderful trip that they took with Laura and Matthew to the Keck Telescope. Um, we saw the, the video that was there. We talked to them about what went on. Um, I'll be observing that was just this year. Betelgeuse went crazy earlier this year. I gave a photo talk. I talked about it at All Space Considered. Um, that was just in February. We had our Golden Griffiths, March 6th. We brought out a green screen. We had, uh, those are a couple of our museum guides in front of our green screen. Folks were tweeting it. We were having so much fun with it, but we were also very worried. It was that night we were even wondering, should we hold a show? Will it be safe? What would it be like? Um, we felt the theater was large enough and the crowds were actually very small. Most people did stay home. Um, the folks that came had a good time, but we, uh, we kept the, the show relatively short. And then Griffith Observatory closed until further notice. Um, we weren't sure what to do. We, we worried, we, we put out tw tweets eventually that said, we will be back and we will have a US, an ASC, a USC remote. There come, there's my uh, thinking about my football team, but an all space considered remote, but stay tuned. The park was closed. They closed the benches. Uh, they didn't want people sitting close together, of course, due to pandemic. Meanwhile, astronomical events kept happening. Um, comet Atlas looked like it was going to be another comet of the, well, not century or anything, but maybe a comet of the decade, kind of fizzled out. It wasn't, wasn't quite what we thought it would be. Um, but still, folks were getting some pretty pictures of it. Uh, Margaret Burbage passed on, and we, uh, we honored her with some tweets and thoughts about her career. Um, Going back 50 years, we you know looked back at the launch of Apollo 13 and, and that mission. And of course, we didn't get to celebrate that in person. We normally would have. We had all our Apollo celebrations for the 50th, and we had to put a pause on that, essentially, um, at least in any, any in-person manner. All Space Considered, remote finally came at you, just like we were telling you it would. It indeed happened. And we were very happy to do it. In fact, our, our, our friend Dave Jewett, Dr. Dave Jewett over at UCLA joined us. And we had a very good time that night. And that was May 1st. So we finally came back. We did have a comet that was fun to look at. This was Comet Swan. It, it wasn't quite spectacular, but it was seen, I think, near the sun and did have a nice long tail. Uh, we saw the first launch of the Dragon capsule carrying um, United States astronauts from US soil up to the space station on that test mission. Um, that happened. Uh, how the universe got its structure, my friend, Dr. Dan Kelson and, um, and Louis Abramson from Carnegie Observatories came and gave us a fascinating talk about how structure builds in the universe and how it, it, you can predict how quickly it will grow based on how much structure is already there. It's kind of a feedback mechanism of sorts, and you'd expect that. Ken Carpenter came that same night and talked about the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope and honoring her with this amazing new space telescope that's coming. It was very exciting to hear about that. So we're doing great things with All Space Considered Remote already. And now Comet Neowise finally came and did give us quite the show. If you were in remotely dark skies, nice evening sky there, it was a bright comet and folks got some great photographs. Anthony Perkick got this beautiful shot of it as well. Of course, um, three missions launched to Mars over the summer. Um, we launched our own uh, Perseverance rover that's still on its way. It's, it has not landed yet, but it's coming up soon. Uh, we had Dr. Katie Mack come talk about her book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking. Um, it was an interesting talk about how the universe is going to end. What can we expect? So um, we did that in August. Looking back, Tim Dodd, we had the Everyday Astronaut came. It was a lot of fun. All of you that watch rocket launches like I like to do, um, we just had a great conversation and kind of got some insight into how he got started with that astronaut costume, 
what was it about? Is it really a NASA one? Maybe, maybe not. Watch our All Space Considered from September and find out. It was a fun conversation. And then um, Mount Wilson got on fire. Observatories caught on fire. Lick Observatory was nearly on fire. It, it was a scary time. Um, they evacuated the staff. Uh, we got an update from Sam Hale, came and talked talked with us all about what was going on and told us that things were all right. It wasn't you know, nothing was majorly burned. They lost a little bit of some structure, but none of the telescopes, none of the domes survived. Same with Lick Observatory, they were saved. But a very, very tough time. Dutch astronomer pioneer um, Van Verden passed on. Uh, so that, that was sad, but he was 94. So but still always sad to lose one of our, one of our greats in the astronomy world. There aren't a lot of us. Of course, we've had fires all over the place. This was the Bobcat fire creating this dramatic scene with the sun behind the observatory. Um, but all space carried on. You know, we had an October all space considered. I didn't manage to make it to the show. Um, thank you so much for the kind words for, for my family, Laura. That was very nice of you in that show. Um, but I didn't manage to make it to there, but I'm glad to be back tonight. Of course, Andrea Gez won the Nobel Prize local professor at UCLA of astronomy and astrophysics. Um, congratulations, Andrea. Well-deserved, spectacular research mapping out the black hole at the center of our galaxy, watching stars actually orbit it, shared it um, with Genzel. Um, but all the same, I'm, I'm always gonna think about is this is, this is our local LA prize, another one for Southern California. Uh, Mars had a close approach um, October 6th, just fairly recently and this beautiful picture here taken and then what about this one? Who took this picture? Our very own Tony Cook took it. Gorgeous picture, Tony. I've been watching your imaging skills and you're using all the, the latest techniques to, to really bring out some of these features on Mars. Just a beautiful picture. So then we're suddenly into November. We took November off, decided not to have an all space considered because, well, it was election week and things were pretty crazy this week, that week. Um, I'm not sure anything's are that much less crazy, but nonetheless, we, we thought it was a good time to take a month off, partially because Laura really kind of let everybody know, dropped a, a huge news on us saying that she was going to be retiring. Um, and if I may, David, I, I, I'm gonna quote back your quote that day, was, which was, I don't plan to be sober all week, no matter the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, preparing a show like this uh, takes a lot uh, in the last week. I mean, so much is done in the last days. So anyway, I was like, yeah, that's good. That's good enough rationale for me. <laughs> yeah, I was saying no matter how the election goes, I felt there, there might be a reason to be drinking. So um, it was good rationale. We took it off. But like I said, in the October show, um, Laura let us know that uh, she was going to be retiring. And so we decided we'd come back in December and we would honor our very own uh, Laura Danley, our curator, um, our inspiration for this show, the creator of All Space Considered, her idea. I remember uh, being hired and it was early on. It might've been the very first week. We're walking down the hallway. We weren't even in an office and Laura turned to me and said, I wanna do a news show. And I said, well, that sounds like a great idea. Thinking we'd have a month, we'd have two months to plan it out. And she was like, we'll do it on the first Friday. And I thought, well, that sounds like a pretty great idea. Well, I was hired the first week of April. So we only had like two weeks to make the show well, by the time she brought this up. Cause I don't think it was the first week. It might've been the second week we're going on the hall. I thought, oh my goodness, really? We're gonna do this. Well, we did. We just made some PowerPoints. We grabbed some news. We went in there and I think there was 30 people in the audience, maybe, maybe 40, um, but it was great. And it, it was a lot of fun. And I know Tony, you joined us in there and then eventually Patrick joined us, but let's take a look at the other things. Some of the other things that Laura has led, um, led us here at Griffith Observatory. Well, this is the timeline. We're not gonna go through all of this in detail, but I'm gonna step through it kind of quickly. And this isn't even everything. We'd, we'd have enough material to be here till midnight or even beyond to talk about all the things that Laura helped lead. We'll zoom in on them here. Um, Laura joined Griffith Observatory 2006, a couple of years before I did, right before the historic reopening, um, was there to help lead all of that, launched a school program, felt if we're gonna be reopening, we need to have, relaunch a school program. So immediately did that, created planetarium show for it. There were watch parties for uh, meteor showers, lunar eclipses, 50th anniversaries and all space considered debuting 2008 that's the year i was i was hired so 
craziness. Um, International Year of Astronomy is the next year, and I know we were told make another planetarium show, um, another planetarium show the following year, um, and yet everything else is going on. These anniversaries of Apollo, uh, anniversaries of Griffith Observatory, craziness, just lots of things happening. 2012, 50th anniversary of Friendship 7, solar eclipse on May 20th, and a debut of another planetarium show, fly over the space shuttle, um, the wave at Saturn. Um, I re actually remember doing that. That was fun. Um, so all of these events were being led by our curator, Laura Danley. We're planning out a lot of these were led over the internet. We streamed a lot of stuff. We had live events in the observatory. We were greeting our public in the depths of space. We were bringing them into the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon Theater. I mean, everything we're doing here is programmed to bring astronomy to the public and to inspire them. And it was all done through Laura's guidance. And just again, craziness, Mars close approach. We're up on the roof interviewing Buzz Aldrin, who doesn't, you know, you're, you've got a man that walked on the moon and yeah, it's about Mars that night, but still, can we talk to you about walking on the moon? No, somehow Laura navigated that interview better than I did. I was in the background thinking, oh my goodness, how are, we, how are you gonna get this done? But we've got world famous Buzz Aldrin in front of us. And I think we managed to honor him properly on that crazy night up on the roof of Griffith Observatory. Um, you know, All Space Considered Remote finally debuts in 2020. So we've been talking about bringing you the program live remotely, bringing it to you over the internet. And we'd done it in bits and pieces. You'd seen us slowly bring it out. Um, maybe if we had a guest, we would bring you a segment live. Well, finally, now we're doing the whole show all because of Laura staging it properly, getting us the equipment we need, making sure we're in the right place and time to do it. And when the pandemic hit, we were at the right place and time and it just took us a couple of months to make it go live again, thanks to her leadership. Um, so overall that time, a brief summary of some of the main things, nine lunar eclipses, three solar eclipses, three celestial transits. That was Mercury twice, Venus once. Venus isn't coming back for a long time. It's under 100 years now. So some of you might have hope to still make it to see the next one. Um, 14 mission anniversaries, four new planetarium shows. Um, and of course, 12 years and counting of all space considered. Well, Patrick, you went in and found some imagery here of some of the stuff that the planetarium shows and other works. So why don't you take a a moment to talk about some of the work that you did with Laura. Uh, certainly. Um, I really want to acknowledge um, Laura for her contribution to the planetarium. So here's our famous Samuel Ocean Planetarium here at Griffith Observatory. Let's uh, step inside. Um, Laura was, um, she facilitated the upgrades um, in the planetarium and that beautiful blue light that you see is coming from the coves. Uh, that was the up, our upgrade of the um, um, LED lights for the cove, um, the audio system, um, the upgrade of the Digistar 3, which is a 4K projection system, uh, to our D Digistar 5, which was 8K. And um, we had a lot of um, uh, meetings and, uh, and got, the, got that all done. And uh, here we see um, um, the inside of the plan term where the audience enjoys a beautiful immersive show thanks to uh, to the equipment upgrades that we've had in the plan term. Um, one of the features of our plan term show is the integration of the uh, beautiful um, night sky, the stars from the Zeiss Mark 9 plan term projector. And we do hybrid shows and uh, Laura facilitated the, the, um, the timing of those uh, stars when the stars came out after the sun sunset uh, from our, our beautiful um, 8k projection system yeah um, she's, she's the only one brave enough to do it the way we do and do it artfully and beautifully and it, it's nobody else does it that's well, that's kind of yeah may add that there's a moment in the show light of the valkyries which probably will never be seen again but um that we're the the aurora come out and the stars are out and it's a winter scene and the line and i think about all the um, lecturers saying night you know it's it's night all day long or something like that and it's cold and i remember that just that was i love that moment the lecturers did such a beautiful job bringing that to life and it was i, I it, it was a real thrill to see that oh and with the wagner music so really what a thrill and joy it is to get to create with a theater like that, you know. And that's right. And uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, Laura also um, gave a lot of theoretical, um, 
theatrical direction to our um, lecturing staff um, who uh, we we do these shows live and they really come out beautiful every single show. Um, let's go to the shows that uh, Laura has been involved in. Um, we mentioned um, uh, Laura was, was director, producer, writer and audio producer of these uh, shows, uh, starting with uh, Water is Life, which is our which we also present to the fifth graders in our school show days. And um, the other shows, uh, there's um, a First Light to celebrate our International Year of Astronomy. Um, the next one is Time's Up, which is the Mayan calendar and the end of the world in 2012. Well, we all know the, how that went. We're still here, so we're still talking. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Light of the Valkyries, which um, Laura mentioned that she had picked all the music. Well, all the music was played, but the, all the music was picked and uh, perfectly integrated into this show, which um, was just so beautiful to, uh, to look at. And I might add, Patrick, if you go back a slide, that's Patrick's artwork, who did an absolutely gorgeous Earth's magnetic field leading to the Aurora. So Patrick, what a, what a joy that was working with you on that show. It was so fun. Oh, thank you. You can really do wonderful things with After Effects. Um, and um, that's not all, because I want to also mention that um, we didn't really stop there. Um, Laura was co-director, co-executive producer, and a co-writer for our new show, Signs of Life. Unfortunately, the release of the show was uh, stored due to the closure of the observatory. Um, but it's, it's there, and it's ready to... Uh, to be released uh, once we uh, reopen the uh, plan term again. And um, we're gonna just go to a different uh, aspect that Laura had contributed to. Uh, we wanna also thank Laura uh, for being able to bring live streaming of special astronomical events uh, from our 12 inch uh, telescope and stream it out towards to the, to the entire world. Um, our first ever streaming uh, was the, um, uh, the transit of Venus, and uh, that was very, very tense uh, because we just got our streaming equipment just about a week before the event actually happened. And uh, we have a lot of uh, funny stories about that, but we were able to do that and we got a record amount of, uh, of uh, viewership. In fact, more than we could actually, uh, more than we can actually dream of because we didn't know that uh, this, this was a great event that uh, was able to, uh, uh, that we were able to stream. And of course, we followed by many um, other events um, in the um, uh, from the telescope. I get uh, you know I'm, if I may, I'd like to interrupt again simply because I'm going to forget, and I'm trying to hold them to the end. But I just want to uh, say that lo that lunar eclipse evening when we had the young man, the piano uh, competition winner, playing the Moonlight Sonata and other music on the front lawn. We had a Steinway. LA Phil partnered with us. We brought a beautiful Steinway Grand onto the front, front lawn of the observatory and he played music while we all watched the eclipse. It was just breathtakingly beautiful. It's one of my great, great happy memories. Uh -huh. So we streamed a beautiful lunar eclipse and we had a musical accompaniment for it as well. It was really great. And of course, uh, the media have always attracted the, to these special events. And so we held interviews in the, in the uh, telescope dome and behind you, you can see the, um, the uh, streaming equipment. Now, all of these events have been, uh, have been archived on our um, live stream channel, and which uh, we have links from our website and also on our YouTube channel, YouTube channel as well. So you can find every event that we've done um, for these special astronomical events on, these, um, uh, on our streaming channels. So now, of course, here at All Space Considered, Laura, we've, we've mentioned she leads us here. She also let us get away with all sorts of really, really silly things. Um, we celebrated the AAS meeting over and over again, year after year, and we turned it into somehow the Super Bowl of astronomy. We'd make up teams for each side somehow. Um, it, it, it entertained us endlessly, and we were allowed to do it. Um, we did things like bad Earth news with a cry on Earth, which Again, trying to make light of this really horrible climate emergency we're all in, but we're still making jokes, but 
trying to get you interested and keeping you interested. Um, she did this to poor Patrick, uh, uh, Patrick Stowe, and the and the well, drought that, that just has wouldn't... to go to Jeff. That credit, that picture has to go to Jeff. That was Jeff's invention. Well, Jeff. this was all done under your leadership, <laughs> though, and it was you know your decision to let it go. And I thought it was a great decision, honestly. <laughs> so Jeff, absolutely, we have a very creative team that does these amazing things, but still. It made us all laugh so much and we get to do it and Laura lets us I guess is my point um, but then this one of course what can you say um, I look really great in a battle skirt I don't know um, but again really fun times um, Patrick was missing that month I yeah believe. so I'm really glad to escape that one exactly now and we've always wondered you know why has Elon not come on our show we've been trying to get him on the show if you're out there Elon we'd love to talk to you but we think we know why um, we think this is honoring you, really. Crazy Elon's used rockets, now 10% off. Maracas in the background. Um, and we just think it's a lot of fun. So we've had a lot of fun here at All Space Considered with all sorts of jokes. But um, we decided to make a, a rather, a much more serious uh, video, a little remembrance of, to just remember the times, the good times. So um, everybody out there, if you want to dim your lights, um, turn up the, the sound a little bit, make sure you can hear it properly. Um, we're going to run this video here at it's around 10 minutes or so. And it, it's some highlights of interviews, highlights of, of different moments. Um, and it, it, it really is, is really great. So I hope you enjoy. When you come back from this, we'll open it up to some questions. Uh, if you have questions now, you can type them into the YouTube as you watch this video, questions you have for Laura. And we'll do some question and answer. And we're going to run a little late because we're only about four minutes away from 9 o'clock. But we'll, we can go till about 9.15 or so. So we'll have some time for questions. I'm Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the host of tonight's program, All Kids Space Considered. And as always, Dr. David Reitzel and uh, Patrick So and Tony Cook. And we're here to bring you the latest, greatest news from the cosmos. Why don't you all say hi to everybody who's out there in TV land? Hi, Mom! There, doesn't that make you feel welcome? <laughs> that space time, like a medium, can also carry gravitational waves that emanate out when you get a black hole or massive bodies falling into each other, the energy release causes space time to wiggle. Did you see how that kind of wiggled there? That causes these ripples through space time. Those ripples come and pass by the Earth, and we always love the scale of effect vastly exaggerated. The Earth also wiggles back and forth because space and time itself gets. So, Believe it or not, we can measure those wiggles. Those are great, greatly exaggerated because the size of those wiggles is one ten thousandth of the size of a proton, a proton. So how is it? What, what do we learn from asteroids and studying asteroids and comets that helps us understand where we came from, how the Earth formed? Well, one of the things that's uh, so wonderful about planet Earth, from my perspective, is <laughs> It has a wonderful mix of land and ocean. But the consequence of all of that geological activity and the water is it tends to erase the oldest materials on Earth. So if what you're interested in is learning about the conditions that formed our solar system, you really want to look for something that hasn't been exposed to that. There is a flow rate determined absolutely back here. It, this it, was a brand new innovation. You designed it? I designed it, yeah. but, and it, it was because they came from <laughs> JPL at the right time. Thank you. How many people in the audience have a telescope? So kind of a small number. Yeah, I didn't get one. I got one on my 40th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first telescope, so I was already kind of in the astronomy thing there you go. before I actually looked through a telescope. But. The Hubble. Yeah. Hubble was my first, right? <laughs> actually, there's some truth. Actually, uh, for me, that's there's some truth. That's actually that. some truth. <laughs> um, I done, you know, grad school. Even, yeah. Anyway, good point. <laughs> this, okay, now Joe Biden's orbit is actually even more remarkable than Sedna because even at closest approach to the sun, it's 80 AU away. So once you have two data points, you draw a line through them, it's just like big deal. I okay. just have to point out the VP in the name, like MU69. <laughs> 
So. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So again, you know, when you're up at the telescope, it's like 14,000 feet. There's no oxygen, so you get you get real creative. So our next story is from the well-known Journal of Gondwana Research. Gondwana is a massive continent from oh about 130 million years ago. And next to it is Laurasia, yeah. my personal favorite. Uh, and, um, and they together have moved together and come apart, but you may have heard of Pangaea. Um, Pangaea is made up of Gondwana and Laurasia. So if you didn't know that, that's because you weren't around then, but um, <laughs> that's what the Earth, in fact, used to look like. And so we can use just a small snapshot, about three seconds or even less, be able to tell you it's going to be a two, a four, a six, or an eight earthquake very, very quickly. Oh, that's so great. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I, don't, I only moved here eight years ago, so this oh. like freaks me out every time the Earth moves. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Just like, yay! Um, and we project that if the funding showed up tomorrow, we would, it would be two years before public alerts would be going out. <coughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was I was I was censoring myself. I really was. Uh, so okay. <laughs> what do we do? How can we help? I, I didn't realize this was going to turn into write your comments. Yeah, no. <laughs> what, what's going to have to happen? Are, are a bunch of people going to have to die first, or what? <laughs> I, I I mean, quite honestly, that sometimes that is how. We have gotten money in the past for station build up. The entire. <laughs> sounds awful. It was cat naps. It was um, three, three and a half hours of sleep each night. So he looked a little tired there, don't you think? His eyelids were drooping. Who is that, Laura? Oh, who is that? <laughs> that is the principal of Esther Al Alligator. Alligator's turn. <laughs> Can't believe I did that. Don't tell him. Uh, yes, the principal investigator, Alan Stern. I like Alligator Stern. I'm not a religious person, but I, every time I look at that deep field image, I feel like I just have to fall to my knees. It's it's impossibly large, and so I, I even I just wrote down a line of poetry that I knew reached out and touched the face of God was just the feeling that I wanted the audience and the musicians to have at that moment. So I basically built this whole thing, just a few musical motives, and then I knew that this would be the architecture for the whole piece, that, that now I have the, the framework. And then, do you want me to keep going? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so then. <laughs> oh no, yeah. no one's interested. <laughs> Uh, we're here with Bob Picardo, who played the holographic doctor on Star Trek's uh, Voyager, and we're so happy that you're here, Bob. Thanks for coming to Griffith Observatory. What brings you here today? Well, I'm showing a friend the observatory because it is not only a very famous uh, location and place that you can come to in Southern California, it's completely free for visitors, which means the price is right. And while I have you here, do you want to sing a, a phrase or two? And if you don't, we'll edit it out. Let's see. In, I guess in honor of the, uh, of the Griffith Observatory. Now all the monkeys aren't in the zoo. Every day you'll meet quite a few. So you can see it's all up to you. You could be better than you are. You could be swinging on a star by visiting the Griffith Observatory. <laughs> but there have been a lot of really remarkable new developments and trends in farming that have been experimented with and supported by the USDA that they're trying to get the word out. And so I supported that effort. So I had the opportunity to learn a lot about soils, which is really cool. So the whole idea is let's get a really healthy microbial system, never till it, that disrupts it, feed them like crazy with all these cover crops, um, and then at the end of the of the season, you just flatten everything, so you get a, a, a like a layer, a, like a six-inch layer of everything just rolled over. Changes that we have seen in Earth's history have been spread out over hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. That's the rate at which the globe changes, and the life on that globe, on Earth, adapts to that rate of change. There's no time to adapt. This is happening so quickly. And yes, there have been high global temperatures, but what hasn't happened before is this crazy, crazy rate of change. It's happening in blink of an eye in geological timescales. As I said earlier, scientists are very conservative, just they'll always say just the barest minimum. So when you get scientists saying, no, this is related, 
that is something to take note of. So when you look at the cost of fighting, for example, these fires, not even to mention in terms of human life and rebuilding and, and so forth, it, it would be unwise to turn our backs on it. I urge you to look at different candidates' positions on some of these things and think about the change that you want to see. You may not realize that there are things you can do, tangible things, reachable things. This is solvable. <laughs> Laura, are you, are you there? Laura. <laughs> hey, hola. Estoy aquí en Santiago de Cuba. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that means I'm here in Santiago de Cuba. Uh, yes, Cuba, or Cuba, I guess, <laughs> for the uh, Festival of Fire, the uh, Fiesta del Fuego, and, uh, and for a few rum drinks along the way. <laughs> so, uh, Laura, are you still there? Esperame! <laughs> Esperame! <laughs> <laughs> Guess that's it for Laura for us. <laughs>
I'm looking at everybody's faces. Um, I think you all know how I feel about you. So um, I have a few more things to say at the end, specific things, but um, that really was beautiful. And thank you. If I can just say too, you know, one thing that Laura started, well, the live streaming of astronomical events all happened under your, your watch, but we were in the midst of beginning to transition to be able to stream other things that are more challenging, like deep sky objects and, and well, things like this coming conjunction of planets. And unfortunately, our testing was interrupted by the COVID-19 thing, but enough progress has been made that you know, as the observatory gets working again, even during the COVID-19 crisis, the observatory should be able to share the sky better because of the things that you've started. And, you know, uh, <laughs> so it's pretty amazing, I think. You'll, you'll have an impact far beyond uh, whatever happens this year. <laughs> oh, ab absolutely. Um, all of our streaming efforts began with, with Laura. Um, so, so you can look to any of our, our events that we do in the future. It all began back because Laura wanted to bring it to more people. Um, the Phil Griffith Observatory's mission to a larger and larger audience. And it's, it's been what we've been doing since day one. Excellent. We have uh, a couple of questions from the YouTube chat. Uh, one is from uh, Paintkiller13, who I understand is an LAAS member. Uh, in your presentations on climate change, uh, how would you respond, how, or how did you respond, or how would you respond to climate change deniers? Um, and thank you for including that in the video, whoever among you is the editor and, and uh, director of that, because that is something quite near and dear to my heart. And in fact, in retirement, I expect that I'll devote a fair bit of my energy in that direction, because it's, you know, it's now or never, do or die, literally. And uh, you've all heard me talk about that. Um, you know, uh, let me put it uh, this way. Deniers who deny because, who are, because they don't know. What I wanna do is help them to know. Show them simple things like that thing about, oh, it's been hot in the past. Yeah, but did it didn't happen in, in 150 years, you know, I mean, um, so people, a lot of people just don't know, and it's not fun to grapple with. I mean, we all went through a lot of emotion uh, as we came to terms. I mean, we watched things from the last 12 years, and the situation got more and more dire. So it's not a fun thing to, to have to grapple with. For those who are just cranky, <laughs> don't want to actually know, just want to be contrarian, you just have to not engage you know, because that's not what they're there for. They're not there to learn. Um, so uh, so I know that, you know, if it's someone that you love, like a family member or something, find a way to reach them. It's tough. Um, but if it's someone who's just being, you know, trying to be provocative, I, 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 I you know, thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. So what's our other question? We've got uh, actually one question that has been asked by multiple people. Uh, what are you most excited to do now? <laughs> um, I really have, uh, everyone who is in my situation has told me, oh, you're going to love it. And I'm, I love my work so much that I just didn't, you know, uh, it was hard to think about. But I can tell you, uh, and so all of you guys who might not be too far behind me, <laughs> Um, you know, the, the, it's an extraordinary feeling of freedom and possibility. And uh, so I am most excited about being part of whatever this effort is going to be to fix the problems, right the wrongs, get us on track. And um, you all know I'm very passionate about uh, climate change. You also know I'm very passionate about that issue about the soils. I mean, it's just astonishing how I, you know, and I talked about this in the last show two months ago, we really do have solutions and people need to understand that because you have to get out of your depression first, see the light, see, feel the hope, and then, and then, uh, you know, take the steps to make the changes. So I'm, I am praying and hoping that we are turning the corner on a, a, from a dark time into an optimistic time. We've spent an awful lot of time, this COVID thing, 
you know, but if we ever saw uh, our need to, to work together, to employ science, to inform and educate what we're doing, um, you know, 2020 was that year as painful and horrible and awful as this year has been, it has really shown a light on um, what we need to do. And, and I'm excited about that. I know that sounds kind of corny and maybe too general, but um, I'm really excited about that. And then the other thing I'm really excited about is I just bought a camper van. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in the wilderness, which takes me back to my, um, you know, I, I used to, I was a real backpacker, camper, you know, wilderness person in my younger years. And now I don't have quite the same physical stamina, but hey, that's what, that's what a camper van is for. So I'm, I'm just so excited to spend time in nature again. I really miss it. Well, that is just excellent. Um, I think we're about at the end here, unfortunately. I wish we could spend more time with you, but the mayor has a curfew for the city of Los Angeles and Matthew needs to get home from the observatory. He so kindly goes in, runs the switching from the observatory where we have faster internet and you get a little bit clearer of a signal um, than actually we even get to see. So I hope you all have appreciated All Space Considered tonight. And, I would like to say a few yeah. words. Oh, yeah, no, that's what I wanted to do. I was going to turn okay. it over to you. Yes, you're about, like, so good night, everybody, because no. I, I would be lost if I didn't get a chance to express my in, incredible gratitude, well, to the people on the screen. But I really want to start with David, Patrick, and Tony, my, my partners in crime. We have had a blast. I mean, it's been so much fun. And, uh, you know, what a joy, what a thrill to get to work with people that I, I care about so much and I respect so much and I have so much fun with and you know it's a it's a blessed thing when you really get to to be with um, people that you care about and, and who work together so well and we've had a remarkable event free for 12 years you know on all space considered it's just it's been um, great and Patrick thank you for mentioning that uh, all the technology pro projects I know we kind of skimmed through them but they were unbelievably complex, difficult. Um, and, you know, Griffith Observatory owned and operated by the city, we're small. We don't have all, all these resources. So it was, you know, Patrick and me trying to figure it out and Matthew. And Matthew, you're not on the screen, but I thought about you through that tribute. Oh, you are on the screen. Hi, Matthew, yay. Matthew, uh, gratitude. I know you hate being thanked in public, but. <laughs> too bad um you know uh so so what a what a remarkable staff that i've had and then looking at everyone else daniel bill jeff sarah katie angelica oh my goodness you guys are part-timers little you know the rest of the others are full-timers um what fun and i know hannah and brendan and there are others elsewhere i don't know where they are they're not in the room at the moment but um you know uh you guys are are, are the team and I could not have done this without everybody's. I mean, some of the things I put out, like, let's do this. <laughs> Everyone was like, uh, okay. And then we did it and, you know, um, stretched it, stretched it, stretched it. And everybody was game. Everybody stepped up. What a blast. So I will have nothing but fond, uh, loving memories of you all. I miss you all. I already miss you all. And, uh, you know, well, as soon as we can all get back together in the same physical space again, I'm, I'm crashing the party. I'm coming back to visit, of course. But, um, you know, big love and affection to you all. And thank you. Well, thank you, Laura. Um, it's been a pleasure. And yeah, exactly. Thank you for everything. You know, really, we owe you thanks. And uh, we look forward to having you on as a guest in the future. I don't know um, for what reason, whether it's going to be what it's like to go observing from, you know, one of our dark sky preserves out there from your camper van. Maybe we can get you enough internet. We'll get you a, you know, a Starlink internet system so you can come live from the dark sky preserve and you can show us the Starlinks going overhead from the dark sky preserve on a Starlink internet system perhaps. But anyway, we look forward to hearing from all your adventures and we thank you for everything you've done for us all these years. And um, again, thanks to our audience for joining us. Thanks to the crew. We have no show hoping to upload some content in January. So keep an eye out for that. We'll upload some videos onto YouTube and we'll come talk to you. We'll come see you in February where we will celebrate our own Tony Cook, who is also retiring. But we will celebrate Tony in our next live All Space Considered coming to you in February. 
Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.